What if I told you that these soda cans can be turned into an engine? In this video, I am not only going to explain about the internal and the external combustion engine, but I am also going to build one, a real working model using nothing but household stuff. And since this video needs it, we are going to make a tiny but a very safe explosion. So whether you are into science, DIY or generally just curious on how this engine works, stick around for this one is going to be worth it. Let's get started. There is a popular Bollywood movie called Shole. In the opening sequence of the movie, decoits on horseback are trying to board a moving train. So one of the heroes, he jumps into the engine wagon and he starts feeding coal into the engine. The train speeds up and it starts moving faster and faster. So imagine this hypothetical situation where I'm on my motorcycle and for dramatic effect, I'm being chased by hooligans. If I find a way to open the, the fuel tank lid and start pouring petrol into the fuel tank, Will my motorcycle go any faster? That is one stupid question, I know, but I'm trying to get to a point here. One is an external combustion engine, the other one is an internal combustion engine. Let us understand the difference. And if you're a student, you could probably score a few marks if you understand these concepts. So try not to skip the video. The definition of combustion is on the screen, but for our understanding, let us call it fire that causes heat, which is going to be the primary source of energy. We also know that there are materials in this world that expand upon heating. For example, the mercury in the old thermometers expand due to heat and we are able to measure temperature. Water expands too and so does air. When heated, water expands, it turns into water vapor, but after a certain temperature, it turns into the gaseous state which we call steam. The use of expansion of gas principle can be seen in hot air balloons and Chinese sky lanterns. The source of fire heats up the air, the air expands thus becoming lighter than the air around it and rises above the air around it, picking up the lantern along with it. So in summary, when heat is applied to certain things, they expand. I hope we understand each other till now. Now let us understand the external combustion engine. Let us assume that this is a metal container with a lid on top. There is water inside the container and when we introduce fire, liquid water expands slightly due to heat but the dramatic expansion happens when water turns into steam. The pressure builds up and if the lid is loose, it will simply pop out because of the steam and the pressure. But if the lid is sealed to the container, it might cause an explosion, we are not discussing that. What if we replace this lid with a piston or a displacer? The water heats up and turns into steam and the increase in pressure will push the piston up. If there is an opening somewhere here, the steam can go out, the pressure will drop and combined with the crankshaft, flywheel and mechanical gears, the piston will come back to its original place. The cycle will repeat until the water runs out completely. This is a very basic explanation. In reality, the engines are much more complex. There is a way to cool the steam and bring it back into the cylinder and the pressure is maintained at various levels to avoid accidents. It is quite uncommon to see these engines nowadays, but we witness the power of steam in the kitchen every day. The pressure cooker. There is a precisely measured weight on top of the pressure cooker and when the pressure builds up inside the pressure cooker, the weight is pushed up, the steam is released and the weight falls back into its original position due to gravity. So in an external combustion engine, the source of heat is outside the engine. In this case, since it is using water to steam conversion process, it is called a steam engine. There are other things we can use instead of water, but we'll come to that later. Now let us understand the internal combustion engine. In the internal combustion engine, the source of heat or fire is inside the cylinder. A precisely measured quantity of fuel and air mixture is let into the cylinder. It burns into gas and the pressure increases and pushes the piston. The gas is let out, the pressure drops, and the piston goes back to its initial position due to flywheel and other gear mechanism and the cycle repeats. Here is a little demonstration for you to understand the expansion of fuel inside a cylinder. Do not try this at home. I've made a hole in the bottom of a pet bottle and inserted the long spout of a gas lighter. The fuel source is going to be isopropyl alcohol. I'm spraying a little alcohol into the pet bottle and shake it a few times. This will remove excess fuel and also let air get into the bottle. Now when I plug the mouth of the bottle and ignite the lighter, now that we understand the primary difference between internal and external combustion engine, 
Once we achieve a repetitive motion, now this motion can be converted into other kinds of motion using gear mechanisms. Look at this drilling machine and this jigsaw. The motor inside them has a similar rotary motion, but the final resulting motion is based on what function it needs to perform, which is achieved through a system of gear arrangements. Let us circle back to the external combustion engine. We saw how water could be converted into steam and run an engine. Contrary to the popular belief that steam engines are a modern invention, Hero of Alexandria invented a steam-powered gadget known as Yolifile 2000 years ago. I have made a working model of this device in a separate video. Check it out if you are interested. Instead of water, can we just use the expansion and contraction of air in an external combustion engine? Yes, we can. The Ericsson engine and Stirling engine work on these principles. This engine is completely sealed, which means the air doesn't leave the engine. So when it is heated, the air expands and it pushes the piston. At some point, the temperature drops and due to the flywheel mechanism, the pressure drop and other gear mechanism, the piston comes back to its initial state. Now with all this information, let us try and make a really simple Stirling engine. I am only showing you what worked and not the ones that did not work. I could have made them work but I would have needed to use extra hardware and extra tools but I want this build to be super simple that anybody can try. Note that I tried this project a couple of times and the following footage is a mixed edit of both versions. If you see some continuity problems just ignore and try to understand the process. I've got a few aluminium soda cans and stripped the paint off them. It was not necessary, I wanted to avoid the labels giving out any kind of impression. I cut an A4 sheet just to serve as a flexible ruler which I can wrap around the aluminium can to make the markings. Then I marked all around the can where I needed to cut. You have to be extra careful when cutting. The blade is sharp and also leaves a serrated edge on the thin aluminium can. It is important that we cut slowly without deforming the shape of the can. With the top of the can cut off and the burrs and serrated edges cleared away, we have the bottom chamber. If you press fit the bottom of another soda can on top of this one, it will fit snugly. Basically, we use the bottom of another can as a lid to cover this container. Next comes the part where we make the displacer. I wrapped steel wool in the shape of a cylinder around a thin metal wire. I made a coil out of this wire at the bottom and made a tiny hook on the top side. A fishing line was tied on this hook. I have made a really tiny hole in the center of the top lid and the fishing line is passed through this hole on the top lid. Once we do a dry fit, the displacer should be able to move freely even after closing the lid. We can now remove the displacer and the lid and close the cylinder with another lid and start working on the next step. We then need to attach a PVC elbow on the side of the cylinder without getting in the way of the top lid. We need to sand this PVC elbow to match the curvature of the cylinder. I started with a file and once the alignment was set, I used sandpaper wrapped around another can to sand it. Initially, I had used a half inch PVC elbow but in the later version, I swapped it with a 3 quarter inch elbow. Now, we need to attach it to the cylinder. I am using a rubber based synthetic glue to attach it but note that it cannot resist heat and we need to reinforce it with heat resistant epoxy later. After it sets completely, we can now make a hole from the inside the cylinder. This works better as the edge of the PVC elbow gives a better support while cutting. Then I took a balloon, cut it into half and then I made a small hole and through this hole I added a bolt with washers on both sides. The washers will keep it airtight. And also the washer should be smaller than the diameter of the PVC elbow. Now this setup with the balloon can be wrapped around the open end of the PVC elbow and secured tightly without any air gap. After this, the displacer on the lid is put back in its place with the fishing line coming out from the top of the cylinder. I made holes in a couple of popsicle sticks and then inserted another spoke and this is simply to help me check the alignment when I glue it to the body of the cylinder. Next I am sticking these popsicle sticks on the top lid making sure it is aligned in the center. After making fine adjustments, I attach the popsicle sticks to the body of the cylinder and use super glue to hold things in place but later used epoxy putty to make a firm joint. During this whole process, I kept checking now and then if the displacer was moving freely, which is very important. To make the crankshaft, we need to measure the distance the displacer can travel. I found it to be approximately 30mm. So using a cycle spoke, I marked the part that will be connected to the displacer. 
I bent it using a set of pliers to about 12 mm so that on a full rotation it covers 24 mm slightly less than the 30 mm we had measured earlier. The next bend I made was almost 7 mm which is offset by 90 degrees from the first bend. The crankshaft should look something like this. Next we insert the crankshaft through the holes of the popsicles. To make the flywheel I have glued a pulley to one of the sanding disc I had and this can be attached to one end of the crankshaft. So we need to attach a metal wire from the smaller bend to the bolt of the balloon. We do the same for the larger bend but tie the string to the metal wire. The bends in the metal wire lets us make finer adjustments for a smooth rotation which is very crucial for this project. So here are a few things that I did to troubleshoot this engine and get it working. The first one being the displacer. I'm not really sure if the displacer size is right or if it is too tight but instead of using this displacer using just the mesh worked for me. I've also changed the rod that is coming from the displacer to the crankshaft here using a fishing line and there is a little bit of a trade-off here. I believe that the speed of the engine is cut by half that's because the crank is not pushing the displacer instead the displacer is falling down due to gravity. I've also adjusted these strings here so that they, they can have free motion. Lastly, I've also made a stove like arrangement so that I can you know, put some uh, fire source here and I'm going to place this over here like this and simply add some glue and uh, make it stable. Now the thing is, this thing is not centrally balanced and when it starts rotating, it's kind of you know, rotates and it, it moves a, a lot. So I'll have to add some kind of a weight so that it can stay in its place. So I've got some weight here, so I'm going to kind of glue it here and see how that works. So I've did a test run. There is a possibility that the joints might have come loose. So I'm going to glue all of them again and do a test run one final time. Here is the first test run. Even though it worked once, the next time when I set up the camera and tried to record, it wouldn't run. After a few attempts, I realized that the connecting rods were slipping. The quick fix was to use slices of a glue stick. And after fixing this, the engine worked. Despite all these efforts, note that the engine works because of temperature difference. In this particular build, even though I added water on the top container, it gets warmed up quickly and the engine stops running after 5 minutes. So what to do? You change the water, replace it with cold water, wait for 5 minutes, let the engine cool down and then restart the engine, it might run for another 5 minutes. There is a lot I've learned when I was making this soda can sterling engine and I'm sure I can build a better one that runs more efficiently. So I'd say please subscribe to my channel video Epo and please turn on the notification bell on. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends. I will see you in another interesting video very soon. You guys stay curious, make something new. Bye.